Hello and welcome Christ Family Church once again to what is our fifth video message during this COVID-19 situation. It's less than ideal, but uh, we're still thankful and privileged to be able to preach the word uh, through the same series that we've been in now. This is the 23rd sermon through the book of Hebrews, walking through chapter by chapter, uh, verse by verse, through this wonderful, beautiful letter that's been, at least for my life, and I know for many of you, it's been a a huge inspiration that has truly helped me understand who Jesus is and, and what He means for us. And uh, uh, we've been mentioning uh, week after week uh, some of the implications of, of what Jesus and His blood signify for us as believers as we hold on to Him as our hope, even during these times. Now, I, I wanted to make sure that we announce, uh, before we get into the, the text, uh, that we, as a church, um, we are... I'm starting to pass out some of these flyers that are both in English and Spanish and uh, just, just to make sure that you are all aware that we want to be proactively serving our community and there's some uh, lists here that are, are mentioned and how we can uh, serve our neighbors and maybe you can pick some of these up here at the office and pass them around your neighborhood that way you get to engage or you can do that around the neighborhood of the church where we meet and so I just want to know, make sure that everybody knows about this before we continue uh, but uh, we are thankful that at least we get to now gather through Zoom and through video and uh, we continue faithfully preaching the Word of God today. Um, again, in our series that we've been walking through entitled, Jesus is Better, today's sermon title is, So Let's Gather. Jesus is Better, So Let's Gather. And you'll see why that title makes a lot of sense uh, with today's passage. Now, I want to remind everyone that we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Now, uh, a few things that we do know. So far, we, knew, we know that if you do drink tea or coffee while you read this letter, remember that men have to make the tea because, uh, or coffee because he broods, right? Remember that from last week. Uh, but not just that, uh, we want to also know what happened to the guy that fell down the stairs last week. Well, what we do know is that he bruised himself. Other than those two dad jokes, we don't know who the author of Hebrews is. Now, there is much speculation uh, as to who the author is. Some people think it's the Apostle Paul with good reason, but many people don't. Some people think it's Barnabas, who was Paul's companion. Uh, Silas, who was Paul's disciple. Uh, some people think it might have been James, the, the leader, half-brother of Jesus, of the church. Some people even think, scholars do even think, that it was... Priscilla, a woman who wrote this letter, and because she was a woman, her name is not mentioned. Now, uh, that's just speculation, but it, it really, there isn't anything that points to her, the author being a woman, uh, and, but at the same time, there isn't anything that points to any particular author. And so, uh, that is something that is very significant uh, for me, and, and as we read this letter, that we don't know who the author is, and, and I'll explain why. I remember there was a time in one of my New Testament uh, classes in college uh, where we actually did a project, a, a paper that uh, had to be a defense of who we thought was the author of Hebrews and why. And, and, and I loved to study those things. I loved to try to piece together the possibilities of who authored uh, this letter from a historical perspective. I, I love history. I love to read up on history and, and, and it helps bring alive or point to uh, reasons why we face things today. Uh, I love history. If, if you love history like me, if you're a history buff, uh, raise your hand out there in your homes. Okay, I see those hands. Uh, just kidding, I don't see your hands. Um, but nevertheless, I love history and I love studying uh, this very book from a historical perspective to try to come up the, with the possibilities of who the author might be. But at the same time, there is a specific reason to why I don't care or want to know that much of who the author is. He is meant to remain unknown or unrecognized, even though maybe he should be recognized for writing this wonderful, incredible, theological description of who Jesus is. Uh, we should know who he is. Think about it. Like... The way we know of the Apostle Peter and what he's written 
and the things that we know about Peter. Peter was told by Jesus that you uh, are a rock, and upon this rock um, we will build our church. Peter means, the, the, the name means rock, right? And Peter preached the, the first sermon of all, of all of history. There probably have been billions of sermons throughout the world about Jesus. Well, Peter preached the first one. And he led the early church. And uh, he was so bold uh, that he cut a soldier's ear off and, and was crucified upside down you know, to not, uh, to not uh, parallel Jesus' death. So, so what, a, what a remarkable character. Or, or how about the Apostle John, right? John was someone that that Jesus referred to as his closest disciple. Imagine that. John is the author of John 3.16, right? Incredible. And they tried to kill John. They couldn't kill him. And so they outcasted him to the, to the island of Patmos. And instead of just laying there and dying, what does he do? He writes the book of Revelation. I mean, incredible, right? And so not just John. I mean, we are, of course, we, we can't go on without mentioning the, the mighty Apostle Paul, who was whipped and flogged and shipwrecked and jailed, goes blind, etc. and etc. And he, what does he do? Well, thanks to him, the church spread throughout the Gentile world and we are all Christians today. Thanks to him, half the New Testament is written and uh, much of it is written from a jail cell. Talk about recognition and popularity, right? And sure, we do know that these men were just ordinary men. I mean, we know that all this great stuff that I'm mentioning about them is because God was working through them in the power of the Spirit. But still, we do know their names. And I know at least for me, when I get to heaven, I'm going to want to know who these guys are. After spending some time with Jesus and hugging Jesus, and I don't know if spending time because we'll be in eternity, but... After some time with Jesus, I'll be like, oh, can I, can I meet the Apostle Paul? Can I meet Peter? But not so for the author of Hebrews, right? No recognition. Um, but that's exactly why I love the book of Hebrews. Because the author is clearly uh, what would be an unrecognized, simple pastor, right? Who, who, who loves his congregation. I mean, he doesn't need to be mentioned. I mean, he could have written and said, I, so and so, but he didn't do that. His focus, his concern is to love the people he's writing to so that they can experientially point to Jesus and receive encouragement and strength upon their faith in Christ. And so, yes, this letter is so incredibly theological and Christological. I mean, Incredibly, I mean, I've learned so much just by studying to preach through this letter. But this letter is actually uh, very pastoral. Again, a simple pastor who loves his Hebrew congregation. And he wants them to know Jesus. And even in the times that he's a bit harsh with them. If you remember, uh, he does refer to them as immature babies who should be eating solid food but are still on milk. But just picture a pastor uh, being straightforward, being honest, a caring pastor who's won this congregation over, won these people over, and, and now is able to be a little straightforward with them. Now, why do I introduce today's text uh, wh about, wh while talking about the author and the fact that he's not known? Because the section that we're in, in chapter 10, verses 19 through 25, the author gets as pastorally practical as the Bible can get, right? So, so we've had all this theology. We've been learning about Jesus, uh, the high priest, and the order of Melchizedek, and, and that he is our sacrificial lamb, and, and that uh, he is our, our mediator. And I mean, over and over and over between the chapters 4 uh, through the chapters 10, we're, we're basically hammering the same theological or Christological theme. But it all is not for simple theological ends. The author is talking about Jesus for the sake of being down to earth for practical ends. And yes, I have a clear knowledge of Jesus, but what do I do with that knowledge? 
And yes, I've explained much of who Jesus is and what he signifies. But what's the application behind all that has been explained? And so let's make today's video sermon extremely simple, practical, and pastoral. Okay, let's start uh, again with uh, verse 19 of Hebrews chapter 10. And it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, and I'll just stop there. Of course, when we see the word therefore, that means that it's, it's in light of something that was just meant. We want to know why therefore is therefore. And so uh, I would say that therefore is therefore because um, he is now going to give some practical responses in light of all that he has said in the entire uh, book of Hebrews up to that point, and particularly what he has written about Jesus uh, between chapters 4 and 10. And then he makes sure to say, brothers and sisters, which is again a term of endearment, a term of, you are my family. Remember, we are all family, you are my brothers and sisters. And then he goes into the two since statements. Um, as a theological summary of all that we've just preached from chapters 4 through 10. And so that's what verse 19 begins to say. It says, since we have boldness or confidence to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. And you know, we've heard that multiple times. Verse 20 says, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain. You know, we're talking about the tabernacle or the temple curtain, right? Uh, but that is really through his flesh, right? Because he was, his, his body was broken on the cross, which made a way for us to have what? Perfect and promised access to God the Father. So that since statement is, is pointing Jesus as our perfect and promised accent, access. But then it gives us a second since statement, and it says in verse 21, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, of course, we've heard multiple sermons about Jesus, the high priest. And so that, what does that mean? That Jesus is our perfect and promised advocate. So if we were to summarize everything, what we do know is that we have a perfect and promised access to God in Christ, and we have a perfect and promised advocate in Christ before God. And so that's the summary of chapters 4 through 10. Uh, we spent 15 or so sermons about it, uh, but here we have these two set statements, and now he is about to get, again, practical with some exhortations about what we do with these set statements. But before we go there and we move on from these two set statements, I, I want to make sure that the true purpose of this theological summary, that the true purpose is accomplished in every single one of us listening to the sermon right now. There's a purpose behind why he even summarizes it. And, and I don't want to move on to what we got to do before uh, the purpose is accomplished. Okay, so please, please listen. Um, right now, what the Holy Spirit wants as we read these since statements is that he wants to fill us in us and through us, but He wants to fill us with, with strength and confidence in Christ. Again, He wants us to think about Jesus and be filled with supernatural confidence. And so I'm asking you right now watching this video, are you confident in Christ? Are you being filled right now with the Holy Spirit? And is it producing the fruit of strength, of confidence? Is that what you are even in your emotions feeling? Is, is confidence what is driving your thoughts right now? That's what needs to happen as we read these summary statements, okay? Uh, let's remember that technically speaking, this letter is written to Hebrew Christians who were being persecuted. And now they're having doubts. They are having second thoughts about Jesus. Uh, they were, simply put, losing confidence in their faith in Christ. Some of them were not even motivated to go to church anymore. Some of them actually were saying, we're going to go back to our works-based Jewish cultural roots as it pertains to our worship to God. So the author, the pastor, is, is not just giving them, again, information for the sake of summary about Jesus. He's reminding them again of who Jesus is 
uh, what He has done, what He signifies, what He promises, His covenant for us. And, and He's doing so to fill the congregation with Christ-centered confidence so that they would not cower, so that they would not doubt or, or, or move away or not gather, but so that they would lean into uh, the hardship, the persecution that they, that they are facing, and they would do so with triumph, with victory, with conquering faith, so that they would be confident. And some of us, and I think all of us, need to be reminded of this today. Right now, maybe you, listening to this sermon, have been running on empty on what is your Christ confidence tank within your soul. You would not describe your relational access to God as one of boldness or confidence. As it pertains to your faith, in fact, you would say, I'm depleted. I'm so de depleted, I don't feel like engaging to the means of grace that God has left me. I don't feel like going to church or gathering with my church. And yes, even today, gathering through Zoom video. I, I just don't have the motivation. I'm depleted in my confidence tank. So these sin statements are what we need to be reminded of again. So that confidently we would point like the ships of our life into the crashing waves, into the high seas of the world with strength and with power. And I do want to make mention of something. Uh, it's not that we are called to have this naive, shallow arrogance, you know, to puff ourselves up and muster up some false strength from, from uh, inside somewhere. No, no. Uh, what this means is that the Christian life is characterized uh, not with arrogance, but with confidence in who Christ is inside of us. And, and not because uh, we have somehow this, this stronger uh, faith than other people. No, it's not the quality of our faith. It's the object of, of our faith in whom we are confident in. And so I would like to even remind us with some reference passages. You know, there, there, there are passages out there uh, that are meant to motivate, to, to encourage and strengthen our souls. So I, I would read again, I read this last time I preached, which is from Romans 8. Um, if God is for us, who can be against us? I mean, that's to fill us with confidence. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or na danger or nakedness or the sword or anything that right now we can be facing anything that the world is bringing our way to deplete our confidence, can any of those things separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer to that is a very assured no. And that's why even in Romans 8.37 it will say no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. And I love Joshua. I always love Joshua chapter 1. Have I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged for the Lord your God is with you wherever you may go. So if I end today's sermon and the result in your soul is not a greater confidence in Christ then the purpose of this theological summary about Jesus is not accomplishing the purpose that it is meant to accomplish. But now we do want to ask, okay, okay, I get it. Uh, we're called, we're being encouraged, and we're being reminded about Jesus and His covenantal love for us so that we would be confident in Christ. But to what end? So here's where we move on from our two since statements in the first few verses and now we move on into our three let us statements and you'll see what I mean confidence to what end well three let us statements that serve as practical exhortations or practical commands number one the first command that I'm just paraphrasing it upon uh, the the verses there but point number one would be 
be sincere in your relational access to God. So that's, that's the first exhortation. And it comes from verse 22 where it says, Let us draw near. Draw near to who? Draw near to God with a true heart. And so I would say, what's a true heart? A heart of sincerity. All right? A heart of, of, of genuineness, of authenticity. Okay? And it says, in full assurance of faith. And so assurance of what well, assurance that in our faith in Christ we can draw near to God. And how, how is that even possible? Because we have our hearts with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. And I would point to that meaning with full acceptance. Okay? So friends, we are commanded here to draw near to the presence of God. But ask yourself, are you right now drawing near with, with the presence of God? I mean, that's, that's what we are meant to do. That's the practical command and response. As we have our Bibles open, are we drawing near to the presence of God now? If not, why not? What are some of the things that deplete us? What are some of the things that hinder us or tie us down or weights in our lives? Maybe right now you're listening to this sermon and you, you very literally have distractions going on. And, and what we are being commanded here is to remove those distractions and access God because we can. Because there's access to Him. We are full assured to be able to do so. And, and we've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So we're exhorted here to be near to God's presence with sincerity, without pretending, without like saying, Well, I haven't been good these last few days, so then I can't access God. I'd be a hypocrite without self-justifying without measuring myself and then comparing myself to others with listen with full assurance in Christ knowing that yes I can be near to you God and knowing that yes I am fully accepted to God through Christ and so that's the first point that we would be sincere the second let us command talks about us being steady in our relational access to God and I get that from verse 23. It says, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering. That's where it gets steady from. Since he who promised is faithful. And that's a very important phrase there. But throughout the chapter, we were told that our faith was upon a promise that we made to God. No. Our faith is not about a promise or an oath that we made to God. Our promise is about an oath or a promise that God made to us. Our faith is upon God's covenantal promise toward us. Toward us, Because if it would say, since I who am faithful am able to draw near to God, it's not what that says. It says, since He who promised is faithful. And I think that's incredible. It's saying that we can be steady, we can access God now, consistently steadily because God who promised is faithful it's a picture of a boat crashing through the waves and the high seas but knows to push forward and lean into the crashing waves because I know the God that is with me I know the God that goes before me and if God is for me then who can be against me what can crash against me that will cause me to to, to fall off. Nothing. Not a sword, not famine, not nakedness, not nothing. And so, therefore, that is why we get to be steady, consistent in our relational access to God. And so I, I want to read uh, uh, another reference passage that, uh, to me, I've preached through this passage I mean, many times. It, it, I have to read it at times even to remind myself of... Uh, what my goal as a Christian is. And this is found in Philippians chapter 3, uh, verses 10 through 15. And I'm just going to read it. Let the words here just penetrate your heart and soul. And it says, verse 10, My goal is to know Him and the power of His resurrection, and that I may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
And here's the sincerity about Paul who writes this passage. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So you see there, right? You see what he's saying. He is steadily pressing on to Christ because Jesus has made me or has made Paul his own. Verse 13, brothers, again, here's the sincerity. I do not consider that I have made it my own. So that's the reality. I stumble and I fall and I let go many times and I, I get depleted and I get discouraged and dismayed. But right now I could say there is one thing that I do today. I forget what is behind and I strain forward to what lies ahead. Again, I press on, verse 14 says, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. So I love that because even if you start thinking other things and doubting things, God is so faithful that He will remind you again of who you are in Christ. Which is, I think, what is happening now through this sermon. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. What an amazing passage, right? And, and that is something that speaks to the steady confidence of the Christian, of the believer. There is a, a, a study that was made by a professor in New York University by the name of William Marston. And he did a study asking 3,000 people uh, this question. What do you live for? 3,000 people. And he found that 94% of the people answered that question, but in a way that points to people living by uh, waiting to see what, what happens tomorrow. Uh, people live according to how next year will be a better year. Um, People wait for, well, as soon as we get out of this, then next year or next season of my life, that, that will be the, the season that I accomplish this. Or, as the song goes, waiting for the sun to come up tomorrow in the morning. And I know that there are people that have legitimate, valley, valued, and, and valid concerns and worries, right? Like, uh, th there are people that, that worry even more than others. There are people that are more prone to become anxious over things above some other people. But even the people of this world that have everything going for them, everything is good, I mean, they have a lot, they've attained so much. Even those people, if we really think about it, they live on such little substance and hope. Like, you live surviving this world. You live surviving this passing world, this uncertain world a day at a time and we put one foot in front of the other but please listen the Christian's hope has substance it's a hope that serves as chapter 6 told us as an anchor to our soul it's like a ship I mean in the middle of a storm and the storm is trying to pull our soul our emotions who who we are in such different directions and we are so exhausted and tired and, and we want to give up and we don't have the motivation to point to Christ right but we have this hope that serves as an anchor to our souls and that anchor is going to keep us steadily there pushing forward upon the seas and and, and crashing into the waves and, and it, it's such such a substantive so, so so deep and so rich this hope that we have our hope in Christ it's one that we can be sincere about one that we don't have to pretend one that we don't have to uh, 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 muster anything up outside of our focus and view and faith in Christ even when we are deep in doubt and struggle and not just sincere, but it's a hope that we can be steady upon. Again, even when we face storms and different kinds of trials. So those are the two first practical commands. Be sincere in your relational access to God. Be steady in your relational access to God. And number three, last point, last command, last let us statement. Uh, be sacrificial in your relational access to God. Not so much to God, but through to the church. 
And, you, and you'll see that, right? So, be sacrificial in your relational access to our church. Verse 24 says, And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Church, today people have a thousand reasons to stay away from their local churches, right? And I know you can agree that with me. I mean, there's so many different distractions. You know what, church? I mean, we would admit even an online church platform will eventually serve as a distraction from what this passage is saying. And that's why even what we're doing here now, it's a temporary, uh, uh, less than ideal way to gather, but it is not what this passage is referring to as we are relationally accessing God through our church. But uh, we can see that this is not a new problem today in regards to people uh, not wanting to gather or being distracted or unmotivated to gather. Uh, we can see that from our passage. Even this early ancient church had a fallout in their attendance. But I would say that this third let us command really is the only true way to live out the first let us commands of being sincere with God and being steady with God without gathering with other people that will serve as channels or instruments of God's spiritual gifts toward me it's easy for me to be insincere it's easy for me to be inconsistent or easy for me to waver in my faith so here it's making it very clear that God does want to produce courage and confidence and hope in the heart of the believer but he chooses to do so in the context of community and so you've got to see that with me God gives this command not because he needs he needs for us to gather together but because we have the need to gather together in order to be encouraged with hope and confidence it's just the way God works he works through the gathering of the saints. He works through community. Now, according to this last command, I, I see a few observations in verses 24 and 25. A, I see clearly that Christians are meant to encourage. The word in my translation is provoke. Other translations will use the word encourage or spur on one another. So, Christians are meant to encourage one another. I see B, that that encouragement leads, it produces love and good works. So we want to we wanna serve, we want to do things uh, that, that God calls us to do in love, good works that we are called to do, that that happens through the encouragement. See, that happens, again, in the local context of a church gathering. Okay, so that's, you want to be encouraged, you got to gather. And when you gather, you spur one another into love and good works. And again, the other emphasis here, D, this type of gathering is increasingly essential as the end draws near, which is why it says, all the more as you see the day approaching. Now that day is the day of judgment, you know, that, that we will all face, we will all have access to God's throne room, all of us. Um, and, and some of us, uh, God may take uh, some of us at the end of our lifespan here on this earth. It, it, we don't know how that will happen with us, but the gathering for encouragement is increasingly essential as that day draws near. So uh, that's why I would say that access to God in Christ is the most essential uh, need that anybody can experience or have, right? And what this passage is saying is that that is accessed when we gather as a church local body. Now, I use the word sacrificial. To be sacrificial in your relational access to our church because this type of atmosphere of confidence or encouragement doesn't happen when our motive to gather is to see what I can get out of it. So, so just to be clear, let's say my motive to gather with you as my church, it is to receive. 
uh, and it's to receive so much for my faith in Christ that then later when I turn to all of you or turn to others, I'm an instrument of that encouragement that I've received from Christ. And of course, by default, what happens is that we end up encouraging each other. So as we gather to exalt Christ and receive uh, the much that He has for us, by default, we would just now turn to each other and we will encourage one another as we now pour out ourselves sacrificially to others. Now, I say this because as a pastor, I mean, honestly speaking, as a pastor, many do say, well, I'm not finding what I'm looking for in our church. And therefore, what they end up doing is that what verse 25 says, they neglect to gather together as some are in the habit of doing. And that's what happens. Well, I'm not, I'm not getting what I want. I'm not getting what I need. So then I neglect the gathering. But the question I always follow up with, if a person tells me that, is are you giving sacrificially? Are you present sacrificially for the sake of others receiving what they're looking for? And yes, although we are living in a less than ideal season, that also does include, and I'm speaking pastorally, that also does include when we gather through Zoom meetings. It, it really does. And uh, I, I know, I know that it's pretty funny that sometimes, you know, if you're listening to the sermon, you have been one that I've had a conversation and I've, you know, tried to, in a, in a loving, friendly way, call some people out and say, hey, um, you know, I haven't seen you in such a long time. You haven't gathered in any of our Zoom meetings. You know, I'm letting you know because I miss you. And, and I know the response of Benny is, well, here is the pastor calling my attention again. And then you turn to maybe your family. Hey, we've got to make sure, you know, Jonathan just told us, you know, that, that we're supposed to gather and, and uh, uh, we'll be in the next one. And, and I want to tell those people, really, that that is not my approach. My approach is actually... Uh, brother, sister, that, that, that's, that's the way that the author refers to his congregation, brother, sister. I, I, I'm asking you to gather because my soul needs the encouragement. When you don't gather, it, it, it's like a, a, a breach of encouragement to my own soul. I need you so that together we can access the fountains, the means of grace together and I, I'm not asking you to like be my best friend and we sit down and hold hands and sing kumbaya that's not what I'm asking what I'm asking is that we just engage in the simple means of grace that God has provided us together his word uh, his his, his uh, sacraments uh, his his fellowship just just being with one another and encouraging one another and 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 the prayers that we lift up together uh, before God, the worship that we lift up together uh, as we exalt Christ and we turn to one another and these songs of worship or these prayers uh, encourage one another. That, that's all I'm asking for as a pastor. It's, it's very simple. So I, I want everyone to understand that the power of this passage because please know that God did in fact leave us earthly practical means or fountains of grace for us to use in order to relationally access the presence of God. And God has left those means of grace for what? For our good. So that we would receive strength and courage and grace and confidence. And then we in turn take that courage and we overflow into all uh, uh, all those around us to, to one another and then as a church we overflow that much more and we extend that courage and strength uh, evangelistically or as an outreach to the community as a, as a service opportunity to those around us I mean that's that's what we are being commanded here to do but that can only happen church when we gather and we do not neglect the gathering as some are in the habit of doing. And we intentionally provoke one another toward love and good works. I read this passage pastorally. And I would say that that needs to be the relational and experiential reality of the Christian. As often as you can. 
Now, this I say in, in, in such intensity, with, with such urgency, that I would say this. Uh, all of you know that our church, Christ Family Church, has a counseling center. And, and I think you know that we are very passionate about our counseling center. We, we get to meet so many people from our community, even people that travel from far. Uh, and, and so we are very passionate about our counseling center. I personally love the practice of counseling and psychology and personalities. And, and, and I love it so much because I honestly believe God has called me and He's called us as all pastors of our church to, to provide counseling. I, I, I was so passionate about it, especially during a time of my life, that I, I studied hard uh, to attain a graduate degree in counseling. I believe in counseling so much that I think everyone listening to this video should receive biblical, spirit-led, oppression-delivered counseling at some point in your life. But, but, but please listen. My deeper desire is that the people of our church that spend a connected part of our church, spend time with our church, wouldn't need counseling. Why? Because counseling is simply a natural part of the community. It's what happens in discipleship, where through our large gatherings and small groups, people care for one another and encourage each other in such a way that counseling not just happens within the context of of community so I love counseling so much that I wish within our church we wouldn't need counseling because it it's just a part of who we are and it's just a part of our experiential reality as a church now how does that happen where do we get that encouragement that care for counseling in our context as a church well it happens through the simple means of grace that God has provided us and, and it's not just, again, an emotional thing. It's, 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 it's not that someone is asking, hey, can you be my best friend so we can hang out and watch movies and, and, and eat chips and a Diet Coke together. We're talking about confidence in Christ so that as you then later spend time with your friends, spend time at work, uh, spend time with your families, that they can see in you that you, you have an anchor to your soul and it's a confident faith in Christ. And there's some people in our church, again I speak pastorally as the author would, there are some people in our church that aren't truly connected in that way. And you serve as an encouragement to me and I hope I do to you as well. But there are other people that call Christ Family Church home and that for different reasons are not connected in that way. And that's just a reality. And, and, and a lot of those reasons that some people may have are very valid. Uh, but here I'm just, I'm just reading off of a command that we're being given from Hebrews chapter 10. We're commanded with this passage to not back away, not neglect gathering, but to lean in, to be sincere as we lean in, to be steady as we lean in, to be self-sacrificial about this as we lean in and know we can be filled with strength and confidence as we do so. Now, let me close now, church, uh, with a few pastoral exhortations, right? Why? If, I, if I'm being exhorted to gather with my church, not neglect it, I, I, I would ask, why should I not neglect to gather together as some are in the habit of doing? But why should I encourage one another so that we would do this? Okay, why? Why, why should I even do this? Well, here are some pastoral exhortations. The first one is... Uh, what I would call, this is a fancy theological term, you know, so, so don't, don't pay too much attention to it, but th it is what it's called. It's ecclesial ontology. It's, it's understanding that the presence of Christ is with us in the church. The reality that Christ is, is among us as we gather. That we would not experience Christ in any other way unless we gather. So to know that when I gather with my brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ will be present with us. That's the ecclesial ontology of why I would be motivated. And why are you going to church uh, uh, tomorrow? Because I'm going to meet with God in Christ. Through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And 
Yes, His presence is with us wherever we may go. That's a promise. But His presence is special when we gather as a body, as a local expression of the kingdom of God. Christ is present through the preaching of the word. Like He's there. As right now as I am preaching, He is, he is with us. Christ is present as we break the bread and drink the wine. And, and that's usually like the... We even in our own church have this like conversation. I mean, do we call that a an ordinance? Do we call it a sacrament? You know, I, I know that Pastor Jose would be very adamant about making sure it's called a sacrament and not, not because it's like this saving ritual that we do as some other denominations would say it is. Not because the body of Christ it literally is present through the bread and His blood is literally present through the wine. It, it's not because of that, but because as we're breaking that bread and drinking the cup, there's such a supernatural uh, experience taking place within our minds and our hearts. And that supernatural experience is Christ present through the bread and the wine. You know, and so, so that is why I would be motivated to gather because I know I'm meeting with Jesus Christ there, working through us. And so that's the first motivation. I, I would say it like this as well, church. It's true. You don't have to be a Christian and have to go to church, all right? Or better said, you don't have to go to church in order to be a Christian. In the same way, you don't have to go home in order to be married. But in both cases, you're going to have a very poor relationship if you don't go home and if you don't go to church. And I'll be very hard to experience the presence of God if you don't gather with your local church. A second motivation, I would say, is the ecclesial doxology. And, and that points to the intensity of worship that takes place in a corporate gathering with the church. Okay, it's, it's, it's when the congregational worship stirs up such an intensity of adoration that does not necessarily happen in solitude, right? Or when you're isolated, okay? And so an example I would give is imagine going to watch a football game in a stadium. And yes, the focus of attention are the players, but you're the only person watching the game. It'd be pretty cool the first time. Pretty cool maybe the second time. By the third or fourth time, you, I mean, so you're watching the same thing every time. But that's why they build stadiums for dozens of thousands of people. It's because the, the crowd, the fans, stir up the intensity of the game, right? And of course, as a result of that, these players make millions upon millions of dollars. But, but kind of visualize it in the same way. I can worship God on my own in my room and it's awesome. But if I go knowing that the presence of Christ is among the, the gathering of the saints and we are making much of Christ, not making much of a football game, making much of Christ who is eternal. And, 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 I, and I, I, just, I just need encouragement. I need motivation. And I've got brothers and sisters around me and they're there to encourage me, it just intensifies the worship, does it not? And so that would be another pastoral motivation. The third pastoral motivation that I think, I don't have to explain much, but it's the ecclesial theology. It's, we would not get the deep theologically, theological understanding unless we gather together as a church. We would not have uh, the, the, the richness of knowing or comprehending uh, the, the love of God if not together with the saints. And um, I, I would say that uh, because I am so selfish and egotistical and, and, and self-centered, if I'm isolated, it just gets to the point where I will limit the possibility of my understanding unless God supernaturally does so from a, in, within a unique situation, but, but I totally depend on my church because if not, I, I can drift away from my understanding uh, theologically of who God is. And um, Satan, that, that's his strat strategy every time, to isolate a believer so that they, in an increasing fashion, less and less, uh, understand the love of Christ for them. And, and that's, that's why, why gathering is important because Satan... Although wants to isolate us, what we're being commanded here to do is to gather. And I would read Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 through 19 to, to, to help 
uh, bring this reality uh, home for us. Verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be, that we've been talking about, strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. We've just been talking about that. That you, here's a theological comprehension or understanding, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints, there it is, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That's theological comprehension that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so it does not happen with such depth and clarity unless it's happening with all the saints. And this passage helps us to understand that. Therefore, that's why I said in the beginning, the author of Hebrews isn't just providing more theological knowledge about Jesus to a Hebrew audience. It's not to have deeper confessional, Christological understanding of who Christ is and wow, Jesus is so special. No, no. He is a pastor that wants to encourage people in Christ. It's about simple practic practices of obedience upon our faith. And he wants to know, hey, would you join me in doing this? Would you, would you join me gathering so that we can love people together, so that we can grow spiritually together, understand theologically, worship with more intensity together? Are you, are you re willing to receive that from others? Uh, are you willing to be at, at the disposal so that others could pour themselves into you, so that others can be a channel of God for you through all of our spiritual gifts. In fact, how can a spiritual gift impact a person if one, they're not gathering, and two, their heart is closed. They don't open themselves up to be encouraged, and they don't open themselves to be an encouragement. Again, we're to provoke one another toward love and good works, but that is only accomplished as we gather, not as we're like camping out in the woods by ourselves. But it's an intentional, sincere, steady, sacrificial gathering of the saints, church. And so, this is my encouragement before I pray. I hope that you are filled with all confidence in Christ after today. But I also hope that that confidence would lead you to respond with the let us statements. Let us be sincere about our faith. Let us be steady about our faith. And as we gather with others, even through our Zoom meetings today, let us be self-sacrificial within our faith. Church, thank you very much for listening to this sermon. God bless you. Let's dismiss now with a word of prayer. Father, um, as we pray, God, uh, we do ask, Lord, that uh, you would reveal to us, you would fill us with strength right now, God, as, as I lead us in this prayer through this video, uh, that every soul, every heart, every mind, every family, every man, woman, boy and girl, teenager, child, even toddler, that they would experientially be filled with the strength and confidence that only you, Jesus Christ, can provide. That the power of your Spirit, Lord, would be poured upon every home watching this video, Lord. And that we would know it. We would know it to the point that uh, we would respond in drawing near to you, God, right now as we pray. Drawing near to you, God, as we uh, cook our meals, as we spend time with the people we have around, as we gather for Zoom meetings, as we watch television programs, but that we know we ha always have relational access to you and that we are exhorted to draw near to you, God, that we would know that right now, God. Uh, I ask you, Lord, that that would not be something that anyone here now has to think of. I've I got to muster up more 
strength to, 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 to be faithful to God, but that we would remember that you said, Lord, that you are faithful and that you would do it, Lord, even in the times that we are depleted, discouraged, dismayed, even turning back, Lord. Earlier, Father, I talked about Peter, who has so much to be recognized for, but Peter denied Jesus. And yet Jesus, after he, he was denied, said, Upon this rock, I will build my church. Lord, I, I would say that that's amazing. It's amazing grace that leads to triumphant confidence. Lord, all these things, we want to pray for your glory and all in the authority and name that we have in Jesus. We pray. Amen. God bless you, church.